Hello and welcome to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we'll be thinking about Porphyria's Lover, a dramatic monologue by Robert Browning. So Robert Browning was a Victorian novelist and poet. He married Elizabeth Barrett, who you may know as Elizabeth Barrett Browning, uh, also a poet who was more successful than he and six years older than him. Browning is probably now most acclaimed for his dramatic monologues, one of which Porphyria's Lover is, and another called My Last Duchess. Both these dramatic monologues have just one voice in them, that's why they're monologues, and it's very skewed. They both present these strong and powerful women who get killed by jealous and insecure men, and the story is told each time, in its monologue, by an insecure man. No women have a voice. It seems that Browning's poems were part of a protest against the oppression of women by their patriarchal society at the time. To some, his poetry is a call for the suffrage movement, and he is, to many, a proto-feminist. He is called a proto-feminist because the term feminism wasn't coined at the time that he was alive. When we zoom in on the title Porphyria's Lover, we instantly get an idea of how his protest is in operation. The title defines that the power is hinged on the lover of Porphyria rather than her. We definitely enter this mindset of a maniac and quite a dangerous criminal, it would seem, in the stream of consciousness we move through as we read the poem. And we've got questions to ask. We want to know who is this narrator anyway? Who is Porphyria? Why is she condemned to die? Is it love if it's obsessional and violent like this? Ultimately, it's your decision, but let's uncover together. The rain set early in tonight. The sullen wind was soon awake. It tore the elm tops down for spite and did its worst to vex the lake. I listened with heart fit to break when gliding in Porphyria straight, she shut the cold out and the storm and kneeled and made the cheerless grate blaze up and all the cottage warm. Which done, she rose and from her form withdrew the dripping cloak and shawl and laid her soiled gloves by, untied her hat and let the damp hair fall. And last, she sat down by my side and called me. When no voice replied, she put my arm about her waist and made her smooth white shoulder bare and all her yellow hair displaced and stooping made my cheek lie there and spread over all her yellow hair, murmuring how she loved me, she too weak for all her heart's endeavour, to set its struggling passion free from pride and vainer ties dissever, and give herself to me for ever. But passion sometimes would prevail, nor could tonight's gay feast restrain a sudden thought of one so pale for love of her and all in vain. So she was come through wind and rain. Be sure I looked up at her eyes, happy and proud. At last I knew Porphyria worshipped me. Surprise made my heart swell, and still it grew while I debated what to do. That moment she was mine, mine fair, perfectly pure and good. I found a thing to do, and all her hair in one long yellow string I wound three times her little throat around and strangled her. No pain felt she, I'm quite sure she felt no pain. As a shut bud that holds a bee, I warily oped her eyes, again laughed the blue eyes without a stain. And I untightened next the tress about her neck, her cheek once more blushed bright beneath my burning kiss. I propped her head up as before, only this time my shoulder bore her head, which droops upon it still. The smiling rosy little head, so glad it has its utmost will, that all it's scorned at once is fled, and I, its love, am gained instead. Porphyria's love! She guessed not how her darling one wish would be heard, and thus we sit together now, and all night long we have not stirred, and yet God has not said a word. Gives me the shivers every time I read it. The weather presents a tense and agitated mood. The rain sets in early. The wind seems aggressive. Nature is destructive and impulsive. The wind is sullen and it aims to vex the lake. 
and our speaker is emotional. He claims to seek peace, not conflict. And we consider, is that because he's actually an aggressive person and is about to commit aggressive acts? Or is he genuinely alarmed by nature? The turbulent depiction from the speaker reflects on how he perceives Porphyria as conflicted. He sees her murder as him helping her, something that as readers we don't condone at all. And it's interesting that Browning chooses a rhyme scheme that is very tight. A pattern of five line stanzas called a synchrone is used throughout this poem. It's very controlled and measured and it mirrors our controlling speaker perfectly. As you can see here, it's reflecting a lack of balance in a power relationship. For example, if I were to take the first synchrone, A, B, A, B, B, B dominates over A. And it's an asymmetrical rhyme scheme that reflects the asymmetrical intent within this intimacy that he has with Porphyria. It's also interesting we have dramatic monologues to form here. She is silenced. We never hear from her. It also amplifies this sense that we have a very dangerous man who's committed a very dangerous thing at the moment with no repercussions. So for us, the facade of calm is an illusion until it is disturbed in the next section that I'll unpick with you. But we have caesuras that add to this sense of calm in lines 6 and 15, and that's the use of full stops to break the flow of what's being said. As if that weren't enough, the repetition of conjunctions and, across the poem, what we call polysyndeton, they show the narrator's anxious obsession and how they're unrelenting to tell their story. The description of when Porphyria arrives is interesting. It emphasises how full of life she is. She glides in, she shuts out the cold, she kneels down, she makes the fire blaze up, she rises, withdraws, she lays, she sits. In any sense, she brings light and energy to the cottage. And it seems so unjust from the off that we know she's to die. As if that weren't enough, it's also clear from the lines towards the bottom of this specific uh, section, from pride and vain attires dissever and give herself to me forever. Maybe she is of a higher class than our speaker. For whatever reason, murder is the only way our speaker feels he can have her forever. And it's interesting that the word forever has been broken here into two words and it mirrors the broken attitude that our speaker has about how they can be together. The description we get of Porphyria in her sensual, physical and passionate terms definitely heightens our understanding. This is about lust. She has yellow hair, smooth white shoulders bare. We understand that she uh, very provocatively moves his arm to her waist and her damp hair falls. In any case, we know that this is an intimate relationship and we understand that our manic speaker is taking all of these cues in as reasons for him to kill her. The tension keeps on rolling in as our obsessional speaker continues to share the details of how he sees the signs. She's left another gathering, a gay feast, and she's come in the wind and the rain. He sees all of these as reasons why this is the night he should kill her. It's clear to the reader that she is innocent and we really judge him for why he believes she must die. Porphyria glances at him and he feels so powerful. He says he knew Porphyria worshipped him. And the verb worshipped shows how much this is about power. But also it made his heart swell and still it grew. Now you could say that's about an erection and it's all phallic. But, and it's about sexual intensity. But in any case, this is about power play and him feeling so powerful. As if that weren't enough, this is compounded by the repetition of possessive pronouns like mine and my across this section. And it shows the fixation and the mindset of danger and ominous stuff that our speaker has. And that's countered further by him then outlining her innocent qualities, that she's perfectly pure and good. The alliteration there 
makes her seem innocent and him sound ever more evil. The most alarming thing that we read is something that's just chucked into the side. Murder is simplified as simply a thing to do, which seems incredibly naive, but incredibly euphemistic, just dumbing down completely the danger of what it is. When he's about to expand on how he kills her, he refers to her little throat, heightening her vulnerability once more. And it just emphasises how dismissive our speaker is of the violent act of murder. The enjambement in this section, from I found, all the way through to and strangled her, shows and heightens how fast the killing actually happens. There's no pause at all. If you were to read it in one breath, it would be quite chilling. Past the caesura when it says, no pain felt she. Well, instantly our question needs to be, how could he know that? The monosyllabic words make this message seem really empty and very alarming. And that's compounded further by the repetition of the exact same message in the final line of this section. I'm quite sure she felt no pain. How could he possibly know? So now we move on to the final section. The eccentric simile that's used at the start of this signals the delusion of our speaker. The image of a bee being held tight by a plant because it's tried to take too much pollen. This point, what he's done is wrong. It's against nature. It's as if he expects to get bitten in some way. While she's dead, his passion has intensified for her. And it proves once more that he's the victor in this love. He's sitting with this corpse and we learn as we read this section, he's done that all night. He genuinely believes he's done what she wanted and it says our darling one wish would be heard. And that's the thing that shows us we're dealing with a criminal who's unwell. He believes she's more perfect now that her darling one wish would be heard which is totally deranged, but also, again, a symbol that he is so unwell. Power and perfection are found for the narrator by savouring this moment, and I think that's why he seeks to sit there and watch her little head. So glad it has its utmost will. The question we have, though, is, is he waiting for someone to find him? Does he want God to find them? Because God hasn't said a word yet. With an exclamation mark at the end of the final line, we really get the sense that he's judging God for not having done something yet. Or does he think there's nothing to be worried about? The, the structure of those synchrones does something to heighten how we feel. It makes us feel claustrophobic upon reading of this crime, as opposed to it being broken into separate stanzas every five lines. There's something about it being too much. And the blocks in the visual of this page, of just one long block of text that moves into another page, does the same. It makes us feel overwhelmed and harrowed as readers. More than any other fact that I could share with you, the most interesting point upon reading this poem is the chilling and uncomfortable lack of closure that we get. As we read, we do feel uncomfortable. And it's interesting to note that when I read the poem, I felt very uncomfortable as I finished because we are fully in the mindset of a very dangerous criminal. We are also left thinking at the end, who else has he done this to? Browning achieves all his objectives of creating a fear-evoking response, but also reminding us that when considering love and relationships, we're also dealing with an, a dangerous territory of unrequited love, of dangerous and volatile emotions that, if not kept track of or kept into line, can do very dangerous and unhinged things, all in the name of love, when really it's egomania and selfishness.
Why not subscribe to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar for all things English, literary and grammatical?